Good evening and welcome to the regular meeting of the Council of the City of Long Beach held Tuesday, May 5th, 2020 at 7 p.m. I have a roll call. Council Member Delury. Present. Council Member Mandel. Present. Still didn't get you. Present. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Treston. Here. Vice President McGinnis. Present. President Bendo. Present. The record indicate the presence of City Manager Donna Gaydon and Corporation Council Simone Freeman. We'll now have a salute to the flag. Uh, Councilwoman McGinnis, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag. flag. United States and to the Republic for which it stands, stands. one nation, under God. God indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Okay. Before we get started, uh, we had an, an item, item number two is up to be added by unanimous consent. Will somebody make the motion to, to add item number two, which is, um, which is a resolution authorizing transfer of funds for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. I, I will. Those will second. I will. Voting, Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. Bendo. Yes. Item number two has been added to the agenda by unanimous consent. There is a uh, printed copy available on the website under the uh, agenda page. All right. Well, uh, good evening, folks. Welcome to our first meeting of May. Uh, for those of you, uh, we've been getting some comments about the sound quality that people can't hear. Uh, it's mostly coming from, I believe, people uh, watching on the Commanding Officers Association page. We've been told you plug in some headphones into whatever you're listening on, rather than using like your computer or your speak uh, your phone speaker that the sound does sound better, but the uh, the sound quality is fine on the city's feed on the YouTube page. Uh, so somewhere between the city's feed and it going through Facebook and out, uh, something's getting diminished in the sound. But uh, so try some headphones or it does work on the, uh, just fine on the city's YouTube feed. For those of you, like I said, having sound issues. Uh, just a reminder for the council members, when we're not speaking, if you can just mute, it will help everyone. Okay, and uh, with that, uh, we'll go to the city manager's report. Thank you, good evening, everyone. Um, what we've been working on uh, staff, meaning entire staff in the city, we've been work reviewing contracts um, with our new corporation council. We've been looking at budget adjustments. Uh, when I get into the budget, um, presentation. I just want everybody to know that has sent in questions. We do look at your questions and we do review them against the budgets. And then I will tell you how we will give you your answers. But the main thing that I think that everybody wants to hear is the staff and I have been meeting on a regular basis, coming up with a three plan phase on how to reopen the boardwalk, the beaches, the parks, the rec center. Um, and the plan would be fully open, depending on what the governor says, partially open or not open at all. And so we met again today and to make sure that as soon as he tells us that whatever we can do that we, as far as opening, that we are ready to go so that the citizens of Long Beach that can go out to the beach or go to the boardwalk and that we have everything set up. So that's been our main goal. We will have a plan to present to the council next week um, and so that we can all take a look at it. I'm sure they'll, after they review it, we'll post it on the website and then we'll be awaiting the governor's um, announcement when we can start opening things back up. That's all I have for tonight. Okay, thank you then. And I guess then we can get on to the agenda. Okay. 
First item is a public hearing for the purpose of giving citizens an adequate opportunity to publicly present their views on the general summary of the proposed budget for the year July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Okay, so um, the budget's been up on the city website. Uh, we're going to have a couple of presentations. I guess, uh, Dave, if you could upload the first one. Give me one second. That was your that was your presentation, correct? Correct. Okay. Is that going to start it? Okay, there we go. So if you can go into the uh, presentation mode on it. Uh, on the bottom right. Uh, one, it's, it, it shared the wrong window. <laughs> one second, I'm sorry. Nice. Yeah, it's can you hit in the lower right hand corner right next to the volume the uh, percentage of zoom? No, it's I'm having a technical difficulty. I have it. I have two monitors going mm -hmm. and I have it on the other monitor and in presentation mode and it's not grabbing the presentation mode. It's just bear with me for one second. Understood. But he got a good singing voice. Entertain people. I do not. Hold on. Looks good, Dave. All right. Looks like we might have it. Yep. There you go. Okay. Nice job. So uh, the city manager is going to actually be doing a the budget presentation itself, but uh, we wanted to give you from from the council just uh, do a presentation that's going to give you some context that's going to help you uh, when you're listening to the budget presentation, uh, give you some context to help you understand where we are. Um, so with that, Dave, if you can go down one, go to the next. One, please. Okay, so basically, the way our budget breaks down is right now, 81% of the budget goes to personnel costs. That's salary and benefit. Another 13% goes to debt service, which is paying off money that the city has borrowed previously. So that's 90, 94 uh, cents out of every dollar that the city takes in goes to those two things. And Dave, if you can go to the next one, please. So the problem is we have a math problem. That only leaves six percent, basically, or six cents out of every dollar to run city operations, and th that math just doesn't work. Um, th the city can't effectively be run on six six cents out of every dollar for the operations aspect. So uh, next, please, Dave. So, and this is stuff you, you've heard before about previous budgets. You know, uh, the problem is this problem has been hidden by some, some bad budgets. Uh, revenues have been, 
continuously overestimated, expenses underestimated, uh, spending is not been based on what is in the bank. And just like a, a for example, if if somebody had ten thousand dollars in a in a budget line item and they spent five, they would say, well, I still have five left to spend because that's what the budget said. The problem is the budget didn't reflect actual money that was in the bank. So there was a disconnect there. And then we just didn't have spending controls in place. Even when the money was short, there was just, there were no spending controls. Uh, next, please. So how did the city has it been making up for that over these these years? By borrowing, which is why our debt service is 13 cents out of every dollar now, it just goes back to paying debt and dipping into the, the reserve fund, the rainy day fund. The problem is the rainy day fund is gone. It has been wiped out. So there is nothing left to dip into, and that's a big problem. Uh, next. So we talked about 81% of the budget right now is, is salary and benefits. We just want to give you a breakdown of, of basically let you see how that breaks down. So our CSCA employees who are, you know, the bulk of the workforce and they're the people who pick up our garbage, maintain buildings, the beaches, uh, work on the buses, uh, work at, you know, fill the offices in City Hall with all the, the functions that need to get done. The average salary, and this is average, so some make more, some some make less, but the average salary of a, a CSCA worker without benefits is just under seventy-two thousand uh, dollars. Next, please. When you add their benefits in, and that's things like health care, you know, medical, dental, pension, you know, their benefits, um, they make just under uh, it's it's just under one hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars. So like I said, that's their salary plus their benefits. The highest paid employee, um, and now these numbers are all based on fiscal year 19, which is uh, the city's fiscal year runs July 1 to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, July 1 to June 30th. So fiscal year 19 would be July 1 of 2018 to June 30th of 2019. That is the last full fiscal year the city has experienced. Right now we're in fiscal year 20. So these numbers I'm showing you are from fiscal year 19, which is the last full fiscal year. So the highest paid employee, um, the just salary, no benefits uh, for CSA was about uh, just over 166,000 and with benefits, uh, 277,000. So just next, we'll talk a little bit about the fire department now. So next please. So for our fire department, Average salary was a hundred and just over one hundred and thirty-five thousand. Next, when you add their benefits in, that added about a hundred thousand dollars in uh, to the salary, so it brought them up to uh, over two hundred and thirty-five thousand. The highest paid, uh, again, just salary was uh, about one hundred and seventy-three thousand uh, five hundred. And then with their benefits added in, uh, 289,000. Go to the next one, please. Now we're gonna talk about the police. So the average salary uh, of in the police department is almost $165,000. Next. With their benefits, uh, again, you add about $100,000 in, so that brings us up to uh, 274, over 274,000, almost 275. The highest paid, again, salary only, uh, in fiscal year 19, was over $322,000. So that would include with overtime and things like that. And then when you add the benefits into that one, that brings that, uh, that one up over a half a million dollars. So we want you to understand that 81% where that's coming from, how that's going out. Um, Cause it's a, it's a huge piece of our budget. So we just wanted to give you a, a picture of, of how that number came, you know, comes about. Uh, there's some other labor costs too. Uh, there's probably almost $33 million the city's carrying on the books right now 
for accumulated uh, vacation time, sick time, and comp time. These are things the employees accumulate over time, um, and they you know carry it over. And uh, often you'll see when people leave, they uh, cash this out. So that's why you'll see sometimes these these big um, you'll hear about these very big payouts to some employees because they've been uh, for a long time banking up uh, this time that they then cash out when, when they separate. And it's a big contributor to why we have some of these huge payouts uh, when people retire and we're, we're borrowing money for it because it's, it's difficult to budget for these very large amounts. Um, the other thing that's a little unique about, uh, I guess, Long Beach or maybe government in general, I don't know, um, is employees get to cash out sick time too when they separate, which is, uh, I guess, a little different than I'm used to seeing in the private sector where sick time is kind of a, a use it or lose it kind of thing. So, uh, next, please. Also, again, because this is all part of that 81%, just wanted to talk about some of the, the benefits the employees get. Um, they get a obviously a a very good medical and dental plan. It, it's quite good, actually. Um, but the majority of the employees uh, don't contribute to it. The exempt employees do contribute 10% to their medical and the CS and the exempts are a small number to probably only 12 or 13. Uh, and then for CSCA employees hired after uh, April of 2017, they contribute 10% their first four years and about 15 and 15% 15 starting in their fifth year, uh, police and fire do not contribute. Um, and also they're reimbursed for their co-pays as well. So if they have co-pays, they, they, they're, they get reimbursed for, uh, for them as part of their contract. Obviously they have a, a, a pension plan as well. Um, employees do not contribute to their pension plan. Again, that's something in the private sector. For those of you that work in the private sector, like I do, um, you don't see that anymore. Many companies have done away with uh, pensions and have replaced them with 401ks. I know in my particular case, my company did away with our pension plan about five or six years ago and uh, switched this over to a 401k that we you know, are clearly all contributing uh, quite a bit to, uh, to play catch up. Uh, this is just another, uh, just an example of another uh, benefit that they they get. Um, that in the summertime, uh, City Hall closes early from July 1st to September 15th. Uh, closes an hour early, so basically the work week gets shortened from 40 hours to 35 hours. Um, so effectively, they, it, it equates to about an extra, uh, if you put all that time together, about an extra seven days off. Uh, next, please. Just wanted to get into again some of the specifics of the individual uh, uh, units and what they get. Exempt employees uh, follow generally follow the CSCA benefits, um, but as far as time off, you know they get 15 paid holidays. They max out at 25 vacation days, 15 sick days. They get five personal days uh, in addition to the vacation. Um, but if they don't use any of their sick days, they get two additional personal days. And then if they donate blood, they get a day off for that and they can uh, donate blood up to two times a year. Next, please. Uh, they get something called longevity pay. What that basically is, it's a kind of an annual bonus they get based just on years of service with the city. Uh, termination leave, when they separate from the city after 10 years, uh, they get a certain number of days pay for each year they work for the city. So if they work for the city for 20 years, for example, they would get 100 days of termination leave when they separate from the city in addition to any vacation they had accumulated or comp time or uh, sick time that they're cashing out as well. Uh, they do get paid if they work outside of normal working hours at night and weekends, uh, and then they get some life insurance from the city as well. Next, please. Uh, they also, um, if 
an employee goes out because they're injured or something like that. While they're out, they still continue to accumulate vacation time, uh, all the other allowances that they get, personal days, things like that. That at sick time, that still accumulates while they're while they're out on sick time, uh, or while they're out on an injury. Uh, the, the city provides the workers uniforms. Uh, if they do training related to their to their job, that gets reimbursed. And this is again just an example. This is I just picked this one out. There's others, but I just it's small thing. But like for example, for the people that work on the mechanics that work on uh, vehicles and stuff, they get a tool allowance. So next, please. Then now we'll talk about the firefighters. Uh, they work 24 hours on and 72 hours off. So basically, they work one day and four. Uh, they get. Uh, 13 holidays, they get 720 hours of vacation year, which is about 30 days. Um, they get 240 hours of sick time and 60 hours of personal leave. So with the vacation, it works out to about five shifts a month. You know, that doesn't account for sick or personnel. Uh, sometimes they also swap shifts, you know, to cover if they're short or something. But that that gives you again an indication of their their time. Next, please. Uh, they also get longevity pay. So again, that annual bonus based on years of service. Um, they also get termination leave if they leave at forty hours per year of service. So again, they work uh, twenty years. They get eight hundred hours. Uh, as you would expect, they get uniform and equipment a lot more. Obviously, the, the first responders uh, have equipment uh, they need to uh, have and maintain. They also, again, if somebody's out on a, a line of duty injury, they uh, do still accumulate vacation, personal days, things like that. And, and there's a college reimbursement uh, uh, if they take courses. Next, please. Police, uh, they work four days on, four days off. A shift is typically 10 hours for the police. So they work four 10 hour shifts and then they're off for four days. Um, they get, now this is of course, assuming no, they're covering other shifts or overtime, things like that. It's just basic. Uh, they get 13 paid holidays, uh, 24 vacation days, 26 sick days. Um, if they don't use any of their sick days, they get an additional five uh, personal days. So on top of the seven personal days, they get that would give them 12 if they use no sick time. If they donate blood, they get two days off. And uh, they're allowed to donate blood up to four times for a total of eight days. Next, please. They also get longevity pay, again, uh, based on years of service. And it's scale. So the longer you're with the city, the more you get. Uh, it's the same with the others. Uh, they also get termination leave. They get six days of pay each year of service. So again, somebody works 20 years, they would get 120 days of pay when they separate. Uh, they get a, a night, it's called a night differential. They get extra pay for working at night. Uh, by their contract, night is, de uh, is determined to be from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. So 16 hours a day is uh, considered uh, working at night. They get also clothing and uniform allowance, uh, allowance for equipment cleaning and things like that. Again, like the others, if somebody's out on a line of duty injury, they do still accumulate their other banks and they also get reimbursed. Uh, next, please. So again, just like we stated earlier, we wanted to Try to help you understand where that 81% is coming from and, and, and how it's broken down, where, where it's going. So it, it, it's a high number. It's a big piece of the budget. Um, with the debt service on top, like I said, it creates some math problems for us on how we can run the city. It's, it's very difficult to run the city on 6%. And uh, because it basically it, it can't be done, City was is is has been borrowing and dipping into that reserve fund, which is which is now gone. Next, please. And not not necessarily going to go through all of this, but you know it's kind of that laundry list of of how we got here, with um, 
just basically the city has systemic problems. So it's the way the city's been operating. It's a systemic problem. The budgeting has been unrealistic. There hasn't been the, the oversight that's that's been needed. You know, the borrowing to plug the holes rather than fixing the problems. Um, over time, the way the city operates is it really operating is in the most efficient way it should. Um, we have to acknowledge there's been uh, politics has been a factor in, in this as well. Um, and, and another big one is a lack of new revenue streams as well, um, which is something that is, is going to be looked at in this upcoming year. So next, please. So, and you get more details during city manager's presentation, but the, the cumulative effect of the, the tax increase that'll be coming up th th this year, if the budget passes, is, is 3.5%. 68% as the budget stands now. The actual tax increase that the city is doing is 1.81%. The difference between the 1.81 and the 3.68 are adjustments that are made by the state and the county to things like the property assessments and the homestead versus non-homestead, which basically means there's a formula that the state gives the city that says, Okay, if, if you have a, a whole pie, that's the taxes. This is how we want you to slice the pie to determine how much of the taxes get paid by homeowners and, and, and how much of the taxes get paid by commercial property. And that's something that the state determines and the state gives the city a formula. So the adjustment due to the state formula plus reassessment stuff from the county makes up the difference between the actual 1.81% increase that the city's doing. And that's how it gets to the 3.68. This does stay below the state tax cap. Um, but there's always a but, you know, we borrowed $4.25 million uh, on Thursday. That was approved to carry us through the rest of the year because of uh, expected uh, revenue reductions due to the COVID-19, uh, it's the expectation that beach revenues will be down and many other revenues. So that money had to be borrowed to carry through the rest of the year because the way the tax uh, receipts work in the city is the city basically gets its property tax revenue, which is a big chunk. It gets it in the beginning of July and then in December, or sorry, to January. So what tends to carry the city through the late latter part of the fiscal year, because remember our fiscal year ends June 30th, was the things like the beach revenue and selling parking passes for the Long Island Railroad Station and those things that happen, revenue sources that happen late in the year. The problem is we don't know if they're gonna happen, so we had to borrow this $4.25 million to carry the city. Now, if those revenues do come in, we could just pay it off because there's the ability to pay this off right away. Um, we're still borrowing money to cover separation payments, because that's, again, a systemic issue that um, is going to be addressed, uh, need to be addressed in this upcoming year. We have to build the city's reserve fund. As I told you, that rainy day fund, it's gone. Local uh, or municipal finance law requires that the city have 5%, at a minimum, 5% of it, basically what it spends each year in the bank as a reserve fund. We don't have that. So right now we're, we're violating finance law and we have to build that fund back up. And then uh, again, don't want to sound like a broken record, but the labor cost, that 81% is too big a piece of the budget. Um, and it's just, it's making it difficult to run the city's uh, operation. So um, why are we still borrowing? Well, here's the thing. If we wanted to just fix this this year with a tax increase and not borrow anything, this year's tax increase would have been over 18%. To basically plug the hole. Um, next, please. Here's the issue. The problem is, as I said, we have systemic problems. We have problems with the way the city is operating. 
So just taxing you to death still doesn't fix the problems that are causing this. So a decision was made that to, to spend this year, upcoming year, working on fixing the systemic issue. We have to fix the underlying problems. We can't just tax our way out of this. So, like I said, and, and just the proof is, we've all had, we've had 8% tax increases each of the last two years, and we're still in a financial mess. So j jacking up your taxes, uh, when you add them cumulatively, almost 20% over the last couple of years, and we're still in a mess. So you can see that it's, it's not just about taxing to fix it. We, we, we can't start climbing out of the hole when the hole keeps getting deeper. We have to fix the underlying problem. Next. So there's not a lot of options here for, for a turnaround. You know, there's, very, there's, there's just a few basic things you can do. Raise taxes, like I said. Uh, we can keep borrowing, but the problem is the more we borrow, the more the debt service goes up. The more the debt service goes up, the less there is to spend again. Um, uh, just as a for example, city's debt service just, uh, I think about six years ago, was only 6%. So it's, it's, it's more than doubled in just the last few years of debt service. So that's an unsustainable trajectory. Just can't keep doing it. Um, we could uh, come up with new revenue streams or uh, increase, figure out a way to maybe increase current revenue streams. Again, things we're going to have to be looking at this this upcoming year. And and the other one is is cutting spending. You know, so there's not a lot of options uh, here. Next, please. So what have what's been done so far? So uh, first thing is we're building a, uh, a leadership team that has the skills that we need to start implementing this turnaround. So we have our new city manager um, that we worked with a search firm to find. Um, she has pretty intense financial experience and, and especially with troubled municipalities. So that was a skill set we were in desperate need of and we brought her in. We just had a New Corporation Council that started, and uh, she's been tasked with improving our our legal operations, uh, which is also, again, a, a sizable chunk of the city's budget. Uh, you may have heard our police commissioner is retiring. Uh, shortly, we're going to be uh, beginning the search for a, a new police commissioner. Uh, we've also been working with uh, the CSEA leadership to, to start identifying savings. Um, they've been a, a good partner to work with. We need to start doing the same with the with the fire union and the uh, and the and the police unions. Um, again, th this has to be a partnership. We we we're all in this together and we have to fix this together. And finally you've you you all know this we had to make a very difficult decision to do staff reductions. Um, not something ideal. Um, taking someone's livelihood away is not something that should be taken lightly, and it wasn't, but it just comes down to math. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the money. So uh, we have laid off uh, 21 full-time employees and 143 part-time employees. Uh, currently, the 21 full-time uh, honestly have all come from the CSCA, um, which is un unfortunate that that's the way it's worked to date, but um, we're, th we're gonna have to be working with the other two unions as well um, for some savings. Uh, also, like I said, we laid off um, a lot of part-time employees as well for a total of about 164. Uh, next, please. So what do we now, what do we need to do in this upcoming year. We need to start developing budgets that are realistic. We can't uh, turn around and, and say, we're gonna bring in $93 million in revenue when we've never brought in more than 87, which has happened in some of the budgets the last couple of years. And the same with expenditures. 
um, where somebody puts in five hundred thousand dollars in a in a line item for something, knowing they're going to spend eight hundred thousand dollars, but then their budget won't work. So it, it's just that practice has to come to an end. Um, we have to hold department heads accountable for their budgets. That's something that really hasn't happened. We're going to need to take a, a, a good look at the city operations and what services the city provides. Um, the simple fact is if we don't have the money, we just can't pay for some things. Um, we can't provide a dollar twenty worth of services when people are only paying a dollar in taxes. It's, again, it just comes down to basic arithmetic. We may have to merge and streamline some departments. We were already uh, there's been some city manager has been taking some action already where it looks like probably the ice arena, the Magnolia Center and the rec will all be merged together under a single management structure, which will streamline things. And again, we have to uh, potentially look at uh, um, the staff, uh, uh, the staffing and what we can afford and what we need. Um, again, continue building that that team that that's going to turn this around. It has the skills we need to turn this around. A big one, something the city's never done before. We need to develop a long term financial plan, a turnaround plan. We've never had that before. Um, we, we the city now has has a financial advisor on board, and uh, the comptroller, city manager, are working with with the financial advisors uh, on that plan. But um, this is not something that's going to get fixed overnight. This is this is a multi year process to get us back to where we need to be. So we need a plan to do that, and the plan that's reevaluated and updated, uh, you know, on a regular basis. Again, something the city hasn't done before, we have to do it. And then um, we're probably gonna have to, again, we've been already working with the CFCA. Um, we're gonna have to work with the unions to bring the the labor costs in line with what the city's able to spend. We just, we can't spend more than we take in. And, and uh, I can't believe I'm gonna say something my father used to say to me when I was a kid about money not growing on trees, but I, I, it applies here. Um, there isn't a tree out there somewhere growing money that we just go get. Uh, we can only spend what we have. So next, please. And this is, this is the reality of it. And this is, like I said, the context we're trying to give you. Um, we're not out of the woods and I said, and I keep, like I said, saying it over and over, labor costs right now are, are huge for this city and they, they have to come down. They, ha they just, they, they have to come down because we, we can't run the city the way things are structured right now. So we're gonna have to sit down and talk with them and work with the unions and figure out how we can get those, those costs down. Um, and it's just, again, some, uh, Basic math, a simple fact of life. If if we can't get those those costs down, because like I said, this year we we made a determination, rather than to clobber people with a massive tax increase, we were going to go back and work on the underlying issues to try to fix them as much as we can this year, so we can then do another realistic budget next year that has. If there is a tax increase, it's one that's going to get us where we need, start getting us where we need to be rather than just, it's just putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. So if, if we can't address this issue, people just need to understand what may happen next year in next year's budget. Because again, it's just simple math. We could be looking at a very significant tax increase or major service cuts. Because, as I said, the math isn't working right now. And um, with that, uh, I'll just finish and say thank you. So uh, I guess we'll move on now to our city manager presentation. Thank you. I'm just waiting for Dave to load it.
save. I'm here. I'm just trying to get it. Uh, trying to share. Trying to get loaded and shared. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. Well, it was there. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, ready? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, the proposed annual budget, we're calling this a fresh start for Long Beach, and this is the budget for July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. There is a, something happened to the screen, so there's an agenda, and our agenda is we're going to talk about the introduction, the budget process, budget highlight, and then the um, we're going to have our consultants come on and talk about the New York State Comptroller's Report. And in the introduction, what we're trying to do, we can go to our introduction. We're gonna talk about the city's priorities and goals. In this fresh new start, we know that we have to increase existing sources and new revenue streams. And some of the new revenue streams we're looking at is, um, applying for additional grants, getting money where we can. I have started asking all of our legislators in any one that has given us a grant example for CDBG, if there's any additional money, um, any additional money available. We're also looking at bringing in uh, parking meters, um, selling of assets that we no longer need. Uh, we do know that we have someone interested in one of our buildings and what we're looking at it is anything we sell as far as uh, assets, they will be sold at the fair market value. Dave, is this for me to move? No, give me one second. It's it's again sharing the wrong. It's sharing okay. the wrong screens. Give me one well, second. I can, I can continue. You can catch up. Yeah, I'll, I'll... So we are going to talk about the history, which we'll see shortly of the financial challenges. In 2011, the city was on the verge of insolvency. Moody's downgraded the city's bond rating five notches to B trip double three from A3. Then in 2012, Superstorm Sandy caused $120 million of damage to the city's infrastructure. Uh, 2014, the New York State Comptroller fiscal stress score improves from moderate to, mo to moderate fiscal stress. Okay, thanks. In 2015, the bond rating upgraded one notch to BAA2 with a positive outlook. And then 2016, the bond rating upgraded one additional notch to BAA1 with a positive outlook. City's finances trending in the right direction. 2018, city is ranked as the second most fiscally stressed community in the entire state of New York by the New York State Comptroller. In 2019, Moody's downgraded the city's bond rating to BAA2 with negative outlook. 2020, COVID-19 happened. The city council passed 4.2 million deficit note to cover our expenses um, because of COVID. Let's go to the next slide. The city has had a history of structural imbalances. This has been talked about before. The city's adopt budgets and financial monitoring resulted in an annual operating deficits in the general fund that totaled $8.5 million over the last four years. That's an average of $2.1 million per year. Uh, total, and this is very important that everybody understands this, that total general fund balance, which is that rainy day fund that was mentioned before, decreased 97.2% from $9.9 .9 million at June 30th, 2014 to $285,000 is June 30th, 2019. This decline in the fund balance represented is a, represented and is a result from poor budgeting practices by city officials, including unrealistic estimates of revenues, the use of non-recurring funding sources, 
and in the general fund and lack of financial planning. And this statement actually came from the state comptroller's office. Over the past five few years, the council and city officials also underestimated expenditures, overestimated revenues, resulting in a large operating deficit and a greater re reliance on fund balances that was planned. And so you can see from the very first bullet point or the second bullet point, I'm sorry, that the 9.9 .9 million down to the 285, that we definitely was depending on the fund balance to get us through. Next slide. The budget process. Here you, you can see, and I won't go over the entire slide because this is one that's gone through every year. This tells us how we do our budget over the over uh, the, the three or four months. Uh, I came in in March, and so the budget had actually started. Um, Ina and the staff had started working with the um, department heads. And the entire process, which everybody must know that the entire process is collaborative. So it's not put together by Ina, it's not put together by myself. It's the department heads, Ina and myself, all putting the budget together. Next slide. So in January, they began preparation of the departmental budgets. February, the department submitted their budgets. March, we had uh, meetings to review the budget request. April, we proposed budgets and then we finalized them. And when we finalized them, we went back to the departments to say, this is the, the budget that you will uh, we're putting before the city council, and this is the budget that you will be held accountable for. And now we're in May and we're doing public hearings and the budget should be adopted before May 31st. So everyone knows that the city will monitor this budget every year, um, all throughout the year. Uh, one of the recommendations that we did see from some of the questions was that uh, we all believe in transparency. So beginning in June, there will be monthly budget reports, budget to actual reports that will be put on the website so that the community can see the progress that we're making or exactly where we are. So we have some prime indicators uh, which points to a bleak reality. So again, you have the from the 20.4 million at 630.15 and the fund balance and at 630.2019, we had a $6.5 million deficit in the fund balance. We've been downgraded by Moody's to a BAA2 with a negative outlook. Uh, New York's comptroller fiscal stress test or fiscal stress score. City of Long Beach is now the number one city in the entire state of New York that is fiscally stressed. And the city has exceeded the Governor Cuomo's tax cap for the past two years. The highlights of the budget. So the proposed operating budget overview that we have done is the 2020 to the 2021 totals is the total budget is not 94 million. It's 2.9 million less than the previous year. And how we arrived at that is that one, it was with the budget cuts. Um, this year when we did the budget, um, we looked at the budget going back, I believe it was to 2017. And we looked at actuals, what we actually spent line by line, and then we did an average of where we should where we should be. We looked at, of course, there were the layoffs, and then that in also would include benefits. And then we looked at the revenues that we knew that we thought we we knew that would come in, and then we also did a reduction on the revenues because of COVID. And so that brought us to a budget of ninety four point seven million. I will say that that 94.7 million does not include the 4.25 that we just borrowed. We will put that in and we are working on ways to ensure that that money will be paid back without any additional borrowing in the next fiscal year. And here you can see in the water fund, the total proposed water budget is 5.2 million. 90.1% of it is the departmental uh, income, and then 25.9% is spent on employee and employee benefits. Next slide. In the sewer fund, departmental income is 90.4%, 4%, 4 
and we have another 29% that's paid out on debt service. And that debt service is money that we have borrowed to do different projects in the sewer fund. Next slide. So um, this is how your tax dollars are spent. If anyone went to, and I know many of you did, went to the website to look at the budget, this is just showing you the dollar and showing you of that one dollar how, how we spend that money. Uh, and you see that 24.5% is employee benefits. When you add everything together, you will come back to the 94% um, as far as employee salaries, that 24.5% really is just employee benefits and that's on an average. And so you could take a look at, at this slide. Um, you could take a look at this slide and you can see all the different ways that we have to spend $1 within the city. Next slide. This is one of the more important slides. This talks about a declining fund balance so that I wanted everyone uh, to see that and you see in 2014 to 2015, we had a fund balance that was our rainy day fund of 20 million, $20 million or $20.4 million. And then 15 and 16, it went down to $11.2 million. 16 and 17, it went down to 19, well, it went up to $19 million. So that was a that was a good year. They were starting to put money back into the fund balance. 17 and 17 to 18, the 19 went down to 5.1. What's important to note is that the 18 to 19, it went from a 5.1 to a 6.5 negative. That's over an $11 million swing from money you had in the bank to now you owe the bank $6.5 million. So if you go to the next slide, if you, I'm sorry, go back, Let me go back one. So if you see this $6.5 million, one of the things we've been talking about is building a multi-year plan. It will take a minimum of five years to turn this $6.5 million back into positive funds. It is a requirement of the state that we we uh, start working on reducing the negative of this 6.5. This will have to be done several different ways. Um, in the current budget, we do have a small amount that is supposed to go back into the fund balance. Unfortunately, in uh, some of the questions that have been asked is when will the borrowing stop? Our goal is that the borrowing will stop within the next couple of years. The, the problem is, is that we have a lot of payouts that are high dollar amounts that have absolutely to, to do with the services that we provide or the monies that collect. And so as we go back and try to do any type of negotiation, we have to work hard at reducing the $6.5 million and we have to work hard at bringing in new revenues uh, but we do have only about four, about five to six years to turn this $6.5 million back into a positive fund balance. The next slide. This is just another slide telling you about the credit rating. So from January 29 of 2016 to uh, February 2020, 2019. And we are now at a one outlook remains still remains negative. It is anticipated that sometime during this summer, Moody's will downgrade the city again because the city has been borrowing money over the last few years. It did not change much from when they did talk to uh, Moody's once before. And that because of the borrowing and because of the budgets, which the state has talked about because the budgets have not been realistic, that Moody's, we do anticipate that Moody's will downgrade the city once again. Slide. So um, this is just a recap of what was mentioned before. We have our property tax and levy. And so the city only raised taxes that we are responsible responsible for by 1.81%. And the over overall tax increase was 3.68%. And so when you see on the tax line item, when you look review the budget, you will see that the biggest increase in the revenue side is on the taxes. That's the 1.81%. This is the right sizing of the workforce. This slide tells a lot. 
you see that in the 2016, we averaged um, in total of 887 full-time employees or all employees. And then in 2017, we went from 887 to 952. And then we went down again in 2018. So you can see this is a portion of what's going on with our fund balance. That in 2017, we had a high force, high uh, workforce. And then in uh, 2018, it went back down to 890. And then 2019, it went down to 884, which is close to 2016. And now in 2020, our full workforce is 888 which is just one, one higher than where we were in 2016. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn this over to, um, to Tom to talk about the New York Comptroller's Fiscal Stress Test. Tom is one of our consultants from our CMA Financial Advisors. One second, I'm having trouble unmuting his uh, connection. Hey, Tom, you're unmuted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Donna. That's all right. Uh, I just want to speak briefly about the, the New York State Comptroller, uh, their role in monitoring the, the city's finances, and some of the tools that they offer to assist the city or, or in other fiscally distressed uh, entities. Uh, so the fiscal stress monitoring system is the state controller's program to identify issues for municipalities and school districts with, with budgetary issues. Um, the system analyzes the financial information that's submitted to OSC uh, against a set of uniform financial and environmental indicators. And it's supposed to act as a, an, a warning sign um, to provide information to the, the government leaders and citizens so they can be prepared to take some some strategic long-term action to to right the ship. Um, there are two indicators that they use to to evaluate uh, municipalities. First, is financial indicators to measure the key driver, drivers of fiscal stress in local government financial operations, and then environmental indicators to get some insight into economic and demographic forces. Now, these might be beyond the control of local officials, but they could still have an impact on revenue capabilities and, and the demand for services. And there are three categories of stress. Um, the lowest form being susceptible to, to stress, moderate stress, and finally, significant stress. So if we move to the, the next slide, you'll see that the city has been rated as significant stress for each of the past three years, uh, with its, its stress score increasing by 51% over that time uh, since 2015. Um, in both 2017 and 2019, the city was rated as having the highest stress score of any municipality in New York State. So the, the situation is obviously becoming increasingly dire um, and immediate action needs to be taken to, to fix the the situation. Uh, on the next slide, the because the city issued deficit financing back in 2014, uh, one caveat of that was that the state controller would review each uh, budget for the city each year, and every year they put out a report of their findings and recommendations for the city. So a lot of this information has been spoken about by, by Donna. And, and the council, but I, I'd like to bring your attention to the last two bullet points. Um, 
that the rapid decline in the fund balance was a result of poor budgeting practices and uh, city officials relied on unrealistic estimates of revenues and more importantly, non-recurring funding sources for the general funding, for the general fund and a lack of financial planning. Um, and over the past few years that they've also underestimated expense expenditures and overestimated revenues when preparing the budgets, which I think has been spoken about a great deal today. Uh, the next slide shows some of the recommendations that the state controller included in their report, um, which the, the city council and the city officials have, have taken to heart um, by beginning to adopt balanced budgets with realistic estimates of revenue and recurring expenditures that'll be able to, to fund those. Um, also preparing a multi-year financial plan and a fiscal improvement plan, which the city has already begun to undertake. Uh, adopting, again, realistic and balanced budgets based on historical trends of actual receipts and revenues instead of previous budget revenues and expenditures. And that once the budget is adopted, the council and the manager's office continue to monitor the situation uh, and see how actual results compare to what was budgeted and expected uh, in order to take the, the appropriate measures and, and, and fix anything that might be that might be off. The next slide uh, shows a, a graphic about the financial restructuring board, which is a state advisory board. It's meant to assist uh, municipalities and school districts in financial distress. Uh, the FRB is authorized to conduct comprehensive reviews of, of, in this case, the city's finances and operations and provide grant funding to uh, undertake certain initiatives that might be deemed uh, fiscally responsible or provide budgetary savings to the city. Uh, so the FRB put out a report last year suggesting certain initiatives for the city to undertake that they felt would be prudent and, and financially responsible um, and that they may be willing to provide grant funding for the city to undertake. So these include things like shared services with uh, surrounding municipalities, Nassau County, the town of Hempstead, um, reevaluating the police department and the fire departments, initiating a separation pay policy and incorporating that into the budget instead of uh, bar continuing to borrow for separation pay, electronic employee timekeeping to better, better monitor the employee work hours, uh, to look into labor and healthcare efficiencies, and finally bring in a strategic financial consultant. Uh, now the last point, the financial consultant, the city has received grant funding for this and has brought us on as a strategic consultant uh, primarily to prepare the multi-year plan. So that that cost has been subsidized by the FRB and the city continues to work with the FRB to, uh, to seek out funding for other initiatives that might be, that might help the, the current situation. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, to pass it back to Donna to conclude her presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to let everyone know that we received several emails and we received seven, several budget suggestion comments um, that we're looking at and we're reviewing each one against the budget. What we're going to do is that we're going to review and we're going to answer each question or uh, suggestion. We're gonna put them all together and put them on the website. We're asking that if anyone is listening or watching tonight, that you have all of your questions or suggestions in to uh, info at longbeachny.gov by May 12th. We're going to put all of those together and then answer them and post the answers on the website. We also will um, send the answers to each individual person that either sent us a suggestion and comments I do want to say that we had some very good comments and some very good suggestions. Um, and I want you to know that we are taking them seriously and we're looking at uh, we're looking at the budget. 
I want to say that the questions that came in, suggestions and questions that came in tonight from 20 individuals, um, there was Bob Johnson, Joseph Raw, Maureen Walsh, Michelle Knox, Walter, Sean O'Neill, Walter, I'm sorry, I, didn't under, I couldn't pronounce your last name, Chris P, uh, Alex O'Neill, Kyle K, Donna O'Neill, Alonzo Merkinson, Sean Nicholson, Regina Crystal, Robin Donovan, Denise Ford, Eileen Hessian, Ed Smith, Ann Chatterton, uh, Levine, and Warren Foreman. Your questions that were sent in, you will uh, see your answers coming up shortly. Um, and then everyone else that emailed that I did not happen to mention your name, please know that we received your email and we will be responding to you as well. Uh, a couple of the people that have emailed us and that have um, a couple of people that have emailed us and that is on this list, we will be reaching out to you for you to clarify your question. Um, thank you again, and please send those in, and we will have the responses back to you and posted by May 18th. That's all for me. Okay, well. That was a lot to take in. Um, and with that, I guess uh, we'll move on to the agenda. Okay. <clears throat> Item one is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract for the rental of 20 yard roll off containers and the disposal of tideline debris on an as needed basis with the lowest responsible bidder. Okay, uh, pretty straightforward. I think something we do fairly regularly is uh, anyone from Public Works on that's going to talk about this? Uh, no, we don't have anybody on from Public Works. Okay, do you have anything to add, uh, City Manager? Do you have any additional information to add, or is this just pretty straightforward? It's pretty straightforward at this time, and it's on a as needed basis. And I uh, did see the um, uh, the memo that uh, uh, with the bids that came in, and this was the lowest uh, the lowest bid. It was the lowest, most responsible bid. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, any questions from the council? Okay. Do I don't believe how many bids do we actually get? Uh, 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 four. Four. Thank you. And I wasn't informed that we got any questions from the public on this uh, this issue, so we can move on to item two. Item two has been added by unanimous consent, and item two is a resolution authorizing transfer of funds for the 2019-20 fiscal year. Okay, so this was to transfer. Uh, hold on, got my paper spread out all over the place. <laughs> It was to transfer money into um, transportation from the contingency right. so that we could have the fire truck, um, the fire engine repaired. Right. Transferring $3,200. So, uh, any questions from the council? Okay. Hearing none, we can okay. move on. On to the voting. Item one is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract for the rental of 20 yard roll off containers with the, this and the disposal of tideline debris on an as needed basis with the lowest responsible bidder. Who introduces move the adoption of this item? I will. Second. I will. Voting. Councilmember Delory. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Member Treston. Unmute. I'm not getting your audio. He's showing his muted right now. Yeah. Hold on. There we go. Is that a yes? Imagine for a second. 
if, if it's a yes, just give me a thumbs up in the camera. <laughs> okay, I see, I see the nod. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice President McGinnis. President Bendo. Yes. Okay, item two, which was added by unanimous consent, is a resolution authorizing transfer of funds for the 2019-20 fiscal year. Would not you just move the adoption of this item? I will. Uh, Who'd you get as the primary? Uh, McGinnis. And I will. Okay. Voting. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Got you that time. Okay. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. Uh, President Bendo. Yes. We make a motion to close the meeting. I, I will. will. Second. I will. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess on to good and welfare. Uh, we did get some questions from the public. Um, let's see. I guess we'll start with uh, Gemma Tanzi asked regarding enforcement of mask wearing and social distancing. The governor has indicated that municipalities should impose fines and penalties for those who do not follow this directive. What is the fine if you receive a summons in Long Beach? Uh, I believe Mr. McNally can field that one. Sure, it's a class B misdemeanor with a fine of $1,000, but the ultimate amount payable is going to be determined by a judge. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Nora Egan uh, asking about um, that on the police commissioner position. As uh, I said earlier, he is uh, announced his retirement. Uh, he'll be retiring at the end of this month. Uh, he also wants to know who is the city intending to appoint as a temporary police commissioner when he steps down at the end of the month and will the position be posted on the city website and will there be a search committee set up to search uh, for a permanent replacement and when? And I guess, uh, manager, you wanna feel that? Sure, um, the um, police commissioner, when he retires, um, we will announce who will be replacing him um, until we find a new police commissioner. It has been agreed upon that to find a new police commissioner that the city will hire an outside firm to do the search. We are um, working on the job description and, and working on this and looking for a, a, oh, I'm sorry. I just saw something pop up on my screen here. Um, we're looking for a, a committee uh, to, to fill the interviews after the search committee has, after the outside firm, whoever is chosen to bring us the candidates, the outside firm would then just go through everything and then send to the city the top three candidates that they feel that would be, that would fill that position. The, yes, the information will be posted on the website um, and all of that will be forthcoming within the next week, week and a half. Okay, uh, great. And then let me see here. I guess there's an, another question. When will the transcript of the April 21st and 30th meetings be available? And then she's asking about using Excel reporting. Uh, I don't know if that's a transcription service. And uh, do we have anyone available in City Hall to transcribe the meetings? So I guess city manager. Um, yes, the we're hoping that the and we apologize that they haven't been posted. We are now having all of the minutes tra transcribed by someone that works for the city. Um, and we hope that they the plan is that the meeting uh, minutes will be available by the next by the next meeting on the 19th. So everything is done now in house. Okay, uh, I guess we have a question from. Audrey Haddon at the MLK Center. Uh, Deputy 
center was deemed on uh, deemed safe and sound after Hurricane Sandy. Why is it been deemed unsafe in May 2020? Um, especially that it's I guess being used to feed uh, some of the people uh, in that neighborhood. And uh, see here. This looks like there might be multiple questions. I want to see if Nick Joe asks. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, our fire commissioner, I believe, is on. He should be able to field that one. Okay. As far as the MLK Center, it it is currently closed due to the. Uh, close to the public due to the COVID-19 emergency. And about April 30th, we were informed that the were issues with the fire alarm system at the building. Uh, the uh, building maintenance had the uh, alarm vendor go look, was burnt out. So the fire alarm in the building was inoperable. Uh, what that means according to New York State Code is that if the building is required to have a fire alarm, and the occupants are unable to be notified by the alarm in case of a fire or smoke condition in the building, that the building is deemed unsafe. I know the city's working right now on getting the uh, system repaired as soon as possible, and I think uh, somebody else can go into more detail for that, but right now, because the New York State Code and the Nassau County Fire Protection Ordinance, without a working fire and smoke detection system, the building cannot be occupied. Okay, uh, and then I guess there's a, a, another question uh, from Audrey also about uh, the, the grab and go program uh, feeding the seniors, and I guess uh, there's there's been volunteers over there that are uh, that that are uh, clearly doing some good work uh, helping helping feed the less fortunate uh, seniors and students and stuff. So. I guess she's got a question about the uh, grab and go program. So I guess uh, Mr. McNally, you could probably field that one. Sure. Um, I mean, there just there seems to be a little bit of confusion about uh, who's running what program. So the MLK Center Inc. is a separate nonprofit not funded by uh, the city substantively at all, and they are the ones that are running this program. Um, so, and they are doing so with their own volunteers, ostensibly not with um, anyone that is on the city's payroll while they're there volunteering. So uh, the gist of the question was a little bit of a, a confusion between different roles of what's a city program and what's, a, what's not city program and what's staff by city. Okay, uh, good, thank you. Uh, on next, Lisa Santinos. I read online that you're hiring Charlie Rubin as the new police commissioner. He's a good man. My question is, how did you find him and how many individuals did you interview for the job? Oh, okay, I guess, I don't, I don't know who Charlie Rubin is, but it's good to know he's a good man, uh, I guess. City manager, you want to feel that? Um, I, I'm the only thing I can say about Charlie Rubin is that he's reached out to me um, via email with his resume. So um, I'm glad he's a good man. His name will be given to the search committee um, when they begin interviewing um, for the position. I did email Mr. Rubin back today. I apologize that it took me a little while to get back to him that I had, in, I had received his information that I would be passing it on and I would make sure to let him know once his information was passed on. So that's all I have. There's nobody been hired. Okay. Uh, and then she's asking uh, on the same topic, uh, how many individuals did we interview for the city manager and the executive assistant for the city manager uh the city manager i i'm not sure which which round you're talking about the first time we interviewed probably six or seven different people uh when they did not uh work out uh 
we wound up finding Miss Gaden through a search firm. So uh, they did they did the grunt work there. Um, so that's that's how she came to us was through a search firm. Uh, Oh, for the executive assistant to the city manager, we received uh, two people uh, applied for the job. Uh, both were interviewed. So, uh, oh, she had another question. Okay, uh, about uh, oh, she's already trying to get rid of our. Uh, she's already trying to get rid of Donna. Uh, she's asking if. Uh, uh, if, uh, if <laughs> If there's a search ongoing to replace uh, uh, Ms. Gaden, uh, uh, not yet because her contract isn't up and if there's extensions in the contract. And uh, so uh, we're, we're not intending to let her leave anytime soon. I'm, I know where she lives. I'm ready to slash her tires if needed. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah. Uh, not not an issue yet. So uh, we have Robert Samitsky, um, our state comptroller, uh, uh, Thomas Benapoli in his December 19 report, reported on abuses and questionable payments authorized by the city uh, for unused accruals and by vi violation of the city's code, uh, the charter and the collective bargaining agreements. What actions? Have uh, as the city council taken and the city manager to end these practices, ensure this doesn't happen again. Um, yeah, good question. This one, you know, comes up periodically. Uh, as, uh, as I guess, people might be aware of. Uh, guess I'm kind of the one that found this and kind of blew the whistle on it. Um, so a few, a few things. Um, first things, as I've said. Several times in previous meetings, we have a we have a, a an internal investigation going on right now. It's being done by an outside uh, law firm, uh, so that that's underway, and we expect uh, something there relatively soon, I believe. Um, and that was something that, quite frankly, uh, you may remember Councilman Mandel and I were kind of really fighting uh, tooth and nail late. In um, in 2019, to get some outside um, outside eyes looking at this, to have an independent look at it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had some difficulty getting that done, but it's being done now, which is which is a good thing. So um, so yeah, this stuff's all it's all being looked into and. Um, Obviously, I, we can't talk about the active uh, the investigation, but like I said, we do expect something there shortly, and uh, we'll be able to uh, share information then. Uh, let's see. Since the beginning of the oh, uh, same person, Mr. Saminski. Since the beginning of the budget year, have any payments for vacation or sick leave been paid? And if so, has our controller, Ms. Resnick, made sure they were proper? I guess uh, Donna, that's yes, I can answer that. Um, since I've been here, I have to check before March, but since I've been here, we've made a couple of small ones. And so not only has the comptroller's office um, made sure that they were right, they went through civil service and they went through um, time through payroll to make sure that what was said on the sheet was in act actually correct. Um, the payouts that we've had so far have not exceeded $5,000. And it was really just for time that they had not taken. Any large payouts um, have to be audited to ensure that the amount is correct. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, I'm going to butcher this name Donna Karolzuk. Karolzuk. Um, and this one's a little lengthy, so let's see if maybe I can press it down. After last Thursday's meeting, uh, seeing the money lost in beach revenue uh, and uh, after two consecutive years of 8% tax increases, uh, 
I believe Long Beach residents should be able to enjoy the beach in a safe manner this summer. No arguing there. Uh, I know Long Beach, uh, the city council has to make difficult decisions during this time to help the town out, but has the idea of making the beach and boardwalk only accessible for residents been discussed uh, as we are a city beach and not a state? Um, and then she just gave some example about how we might be able to do that. Um, uh, and this basically would limit the amount of people coming in while allowing residents to still enjoy their beach. Um, okay, so uh, basically, I think the city manager kind of addressed that in the beginning of the meeting and remarks that the staff is now putting together a, um, a plan uh, for various scenarios that are going to look at all these things. I know there's uh, some legal questions are, are, um, uh, are Corp Council's looking at too about the legalities of whether it can be resident only since got to remember the beach was paid for with Army Corps money, Army Corps of Engineers money and the boardwalk with FEMA money. So that's, I believe is, uh, is also being looked at, but uh, so these plans are, are being developed and should be coming out soon because we obviously have to be prepared in case we do get to do get to open up on time. And then uh, she had a follow up, um, just I guess asking if Congresswoman Kathleen Rice is the right person to contact to get some support for Long Beach or, uh, so she could uh, spread the word. Um, yeah, it's it's not just uh, uh, Kathleen Rice. All the help we can get uh, if residents want to reach out to the other elected officials. Um, it's Senator Schumer. It's uh, obviously Congresswoman Rice, um, Governor Cuomo, Senator Kaminsky, Assemblywoman Miller, Legislator Ford. Um, all the all of our uh, elected representatives. Uh, they're, we're guessing they're all thinking like us. They're all on the same page as us. So, uh, any uh, any help and support we can get from them is uh, is, is appreciated. Um, clearly, Long Beach is not uh, unique. There's a lot of other municipalities out there now, also in similar situations. So, uh, a lot of people are looking for help right now. Uh, John Weeder uh, wants. To know uh, now that the sale, uh, sale of beach passes has been delayed, what's the new schedule for selling the beach passes? Uh, has it been considered to sell them in phases? Uh, and also, when asking when will the beaches open? So, um, and then he's had the same uh, question about the boardwalk. What are the plans for uh, the boardwalk and uh, when it might be reopening? So again. Uh, not to sound like a broken record, that'll all be part of these, uh, the, the plan that the staff is working on now. And uh, as soon as that's uh, done, we'll be able to share that. And, oh, and that was actually the last question. So with that, I guess we're done. So thanks everyone for coming out. Um, we dumped a lot of information on you tonight, uh, but um, we hope it helped. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the, at the next meeting. And remember, please, if you go out, you can't social distance, wear a mask. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good night, everyone. Don't forget to fill out your census. Yes, please. Fill out, 